Hello, QPL. Thanks for tuning in to hear about uh, some joint work I did with John Selby, David Schmid, and Rob Speckins, which you can find on the archive here. Um, this work is looking at the generalized notion of non-contextuality due to Rob Speckins. And what we find is that if you pay attention to what happens to transformations in these models, you realize that there's a lot less freedom in defining non-contextual models than you might have thought. So whilst just by looking at the definition, you might think that you can choose how to represent your preparations, measurements, and transformations more or less independently, uh, we show that in fact, once you've decided how to represent your states, that fixes how you represent your transformations and your measurements. Um, and whilst you might have thought that you can help yourself to as many ontic states as you need when constructing the model, we show that in fact, the number of ontic states has to equal the dimension of the operational state space. Um, so I'll be saying all that a bit more precisely in a moment, but first I'll just recap this notion of non-contextuality that we're gonna be using. Um, so this is based on a, a kind of principle of non-contextuality, which loosely speaking says that you should have no distinctions without a difference or to use Leibniz's language, it's the identity of indiscernibles. A bit more precisely, we're gonna say that there should be no distinctions at the ontological level, the level of what's really going on, uh, unless there's a difference at the operational level, the level we can see in the lab. Um, so this is all within the standard framework of ontological models. So what we can see in the lab is these operational probabilities of getting some outcome K, given a preparation procedure P, a transformation procedure T, and a measurement procedure M. And in an ontological model, we suppose that the reason why these outcome probabilities depend on how you prepared, transformed, and measured the system is that there's some ontic state going from the preparation through the transformation and to the measurement device. Um, and that when you prepare the system, that has some influence on the ontic states. When you transform the system, uh that influences the old ontic state to some new ontic state and then when you measure the system the probabilities of the outcomes depend on the ontic state of the system okay and the non-trivial assumption here is that these outcomes only depend on the preparation and transformation via the ontic state okay so the ontic state screens off the correlation between the preparation transformation and measurement outcome um but Knowing the preparation might not allow you to know the ontic state exactly, so we have some probabilities for ontic states given the preparation. Likewise, knowing the transformation, we have some probabilities for the output ontic state given the input ontic state. And given the measurement, we have some probabilities for the outcome given the ontic state that we're measuring. Um, but again, operationally, we never see these ontic states, so we just integrate over those to recover the operational probabilities. Okay. So, so far you can represent any probabilities using this. So now we're gonna add in this uh, principle of non-contextuality. Uh, but before we do that, uh, just need to make a simple observation about convexity, um, which is that if some procedure, say a preparation procedure P consists of doing a procedure P1 with probability Q and some other procedure P2 with probability one minus Q, then that has to be represented in your ontological model by the corresponding mixture of probabilities, okay? Because with probability Q, we did P1 and therefore got some lambda from, from P1. And with probability one minus Q, we did P2 and therefore got a lambda from there. And therefore the overall probability for a given lambda just has to be that mixture. All right, so now we can apply the principle of non-contextuality to measurements. Um, and we can suppose that we have two measurement procedures, M and M primed, that are such that you get the same probabilities of the outcomes, regardless of which preparation and transformation you've done prior to M or M primed, okay? So no matter what preparation or transformation we do, we can never see an operational difference between M and M primed. And now the principle of non-contextuality says, if there's no operational difference, there had better be no ontological difference. And here that means that the probabilities for the outcomes 
uh, given m and m primed have to be the same for all ontic states. Okay. Um, so if it was the same for all ontic states, that would imply the operational equivalence in any ontological model. But we're saying that the best way to explain the operational equivalence is via that root. It's to say that the reason you can't tell the difference between m and m primed, given all the preparations and transformations you can do, is that there is no difference between m and m primed on any ontic state lambda. OK. Um, it's going to be useful to formulate this slightly differently, um, which is instead of talking about m and m primed, which are these two different ways of measuring the system that turn out to be operationally equivalent, we can just form equivalence classes of measurements. Um, so we just, if two different measurements give the same statistics uh, for all preparations and transformations, then we just use the same mathematical objects to denote the two different measurements. Um, and here I'm going to use the notation EK for that object. Okay, so EK represents some equivalence class of measurement outcomes that give the same probabilities uh, for all preparations and transformations. And the reason I'm using this notation is that in quantum theory, that would just be a POVM element. Okay, in quantum theory, a outcome gives the same probability on all states, if and only if that outcome is represented by the same positive operator. In a POVM. Okay. And now that we're using this notation, then the assumption of measurement non contextuality is simply that the probability of getting your outcome K given your ontic state lambda only depends on this equivalence class. Okay. So if I'm writing the probability in this form, where I'm only using the equivalence class here, it's automatically non contextual because the only information I'm allowing it to depend on is the information about which equivalence class I'm in. Um, and all this is spelled out very carefully and nicely in this paper. OK, um, so now, given we're at QPL, we're going to draw some pictures. Um, fairly standard ones. Time's going to go from bottom to top. Um, if I draw F and G like this, it means there are two processes happening in parallel. And over here, I have F followed by H on the same system. Um, a procedure with no input, i.e. a preparation, I'm going to draw like this. And a procedure with no output, which is a sort of destructive measurement, I'm going to draw like this. And if I wire, wire a circuit up like this, then that's just going to represent the probability of getting this outcome given this preparation and this transformation. And the way operational equivalences are represented in these diagrams, for instance, if I have uh, a measurement outcome E and another one E primed that give the same probabilities uh, for any preparation, uh, is that I would just take E and E primed to be equal. Okay, so. Um, these diagrams really represent the operational equivalence classes. So if two procedures are operationally equivalent, then um, they're just drawn as the same thing. OK, so uh, operational equivalence is kind of uh, baked into these pictures. Um, OK, and now I'll introduce some notation uh, for the ontological models in diagrammatic form. Uh, and it's going to be using these blue boxes. So if I take one of my preparations and draw a blue box around it, then I'm talking about the probability of the ontic state given that preparation. Okay. Uh, if I draw a blue box around a measurement, I'm talking about the probability of that measurement outcome given the ontic state coming in here. And if I draw a blue box around a transformation, I'm talking about the probability of the ontic state, new ontic state coming out here, given the initial ontic state coming in here. Okay. And because the uh, notion of operational equivalence class has been baked in. Okay. Um, this probability can only depend on the operational equivalence class of P. And so it's automatically non contextual. Likewise, um, this probability can only depend on the operational equivalence class of the measurement. So we automatically have measurement non contextuality. And this can only depend on the uh, operational equivalence class of the transformation. So we have transformation and contextuality. Okay, so that's how I'm going to 
represent ontological models in this diagram. And again, the, the these diagrams just bake in non-contextuality from the start. Okay, um, so now I can wire together these things like this. Um, so something, a subtlety with this diagrammatic notation is that thick lines like this represent a physical system, so a quantum system, say, whereas thin lines represent ontic states. Um, and if I join together thin lines like this, um, it just means integrating over the corresponding ontic state. So when I draw this diagram on the right, that's just the same as doing this calculation on the right here. Um, so this equation can be represented diagrammatically like this. All right. Uh, so now I'm ready to um, state the structure theorem. Um, it's going to have two main assumptions. The first is diagram preservation, which says that when I draw a blue box around something, I can equivalently draw a blue box around all of the components of that thing. Okay, So an uncontroversial instance of this assumption is that if I want to know the probability of this outcome, given this preparation and transformation according to the ontological model, then I should look at the probability of the ontic state given the preparation, how the ontic state changes according to the transformation, and then how the ontic state influences the measurement and integrate all of that. Okay. Um, and then the requirement that we had before that we reproduce the operational probabilities can just be written in this very nice form here. Okay. So we haven't really done anything yet. Um, we're just stating the standard condition of an operational, of an ontological model um, in this sort of diagram preservation language. Okay, um, a slightly more potentially controversial application of diagram preservation is that the representation of the operational identity, which is the thick black line in the ontological model has to be the identity operation at the ontological level, which is the thin black line. Another potentially controversial application of diagram preservation is to a transformation that consists of a measurement followed by a preparation. Okay, So at the operational level, the only thing that connects this incoming system to this outgoing system is that the way we re-prepare the system might depend on the measurement outcome we got from the incoming system. And then according to diagram preservation, the representation of this transformation in the ontological model is just taken by multiplying the representation of the measurement in the ontological model with the representation of the preparation in the ontological model. So the only dependence of the outgoing ontic state on the incoming ontic state is again just via the correlation between how we prepared the system and how we measured it. Okay, there's no extra information going from the input to the output of this transformation. Um, so in equations, what we're saying is that the representation of the operational identity is just a sort of direct delta function on the ontic state. And the representation of this measure and prepare transformation is just um, the product of the representation of the preparation with the representation of the measurement. Okay, so the second assumption we need is um, nothing to do with the ontological model. It's just a property of the operational theory. Um, and it's a fairly well studied one called local tomography. Uh, if you haven't seen it before, don't worry too much about this picture. Um, we're basically just saying that if you want to do tomography to work out what transformation you're implementing, it suffices to just use product states and product measurements. For our purposes, um, so this is true in quantum theory, the following equivalent, uh, and it's true in various uh, other conditions for local tomography theories, that which is that any transformation T 
can be represented as a linear combination of measure and prepare transformations. Okay, so for any T, I can choose some measurements, preparations, and coefficients such that um, this linear combination of those things uh, gives me the same probabilities on all possible preparations and measurements here. Okay, so we're not actually saying that physically this transformation uh, consists of these measure and prepare channels. Um, indeed, this doesn't make much physical sense because these coefficients don't have to be valid probabilities. All we're saying is that because the notion of operational equivalence has been baked in, we're just saying that taking this mathematical combination gives you the same probabilities as if you'd used the original transformation. Um, so this might look a little bit weird, but if you're familiar with the Troy Jamalkowski isomorphism in quantum theory, um, then you might know that measure and prepare channels are represented by product states in the isomorphism. And then this condition is just saying that any state, any bipartite state, even an entangled one, can be written as a linear combination of product states. Um, and again, the coefficients in that don't have to be valid probabilities, because if they were, you'd be talking about separable states. OK, so given those two assumptions of a diagram preserving non-contextual model of a locally tomographic theory, our structure theorem states that the representation of any transformation in that model is given using some linear map chi after the transformation um, and its inverse before the transformation. OK, um, and one thing I'm suppressing here is that if your operational theory has different types of systems, for example, qubits and qtrits, then you have a different map chi for each of those systems. OK, but other than that, chi is fixed. So it's going to be the same chi for all the different qubit transformations, for example. OK, so what is this chi? This seems a bit confusing. Um, well, a special case of this equation would just be to consider a preparation, which is a special kind of transformation. Um, and then the only thing we'd have to do to represent the preparation is to put this chi after it. So basically, this map chi is just another way of writing um, the transformation from an operational state P to the probabilities of the ontic states given that preparation P. OK, so that's what I said about the start at the start, which is that the only freedom in defining the ontological model is to choose how the preparations are represented. In other words, to choose this chi. OK, so now let me run through the proof of this theorem. Um, step one is to use our formulation of local tomography to replace T by the corresponding linear combination of measure and prepare transformations. Um, and then, if we remember at the start, I talked about how a convex combination of procedures at the operational level has to be represented by the same convex combination at the ontological level. Um, there's a kind of standard mathematical argument you can use to extend that from convex combinations to all linear combinations. And so that allows us to use linearity to pull out these coefficients um, outside of the blue box. And then we can use diagram preservation to say that the representation of each of the measure and prepare channels is just given by combining the representation of the measurement with the representation of the preparation. OK, so that's step one. Step two is to focus on how that preparation is going to be represented. Um, and what we do is, again, recalling that this thing has to respect convex combinations, we do the standard thing to um, extend that to full linearity. And then we can say that since drawing this blue box over it is just a linear transformation, uh, we can just kind of define a different notation for that same linear transformation um, of just thinking of it as something that acts after P. 
Okay. Um, but this isn't necessarily a physical transformation. In fact, it generally won't be a transformation that you could actually implement. Um, but uh, it is a valid linear transformation um, that takes you from your uh, operational state to your distribution over ontic states. Um, and so we can include it in our diagrams in this form. Um, and likewise, if we think about the convexity of measurements, extend that to linearity, uh, we, can, we can choose a new notation for the representation of measurements, which is just to proceed them with some linear map phi. Okay, so combining what we've done so far, um, we had that the transformation is represented by a linear combination of the representations of the measurements and the preparations. And we had that those are represented using these chi and phi gadgets. Um, and then if we just apply linearity again, we can turn this linear combination in here back into T. And then we've almost got what we want, except instead of phi here, we want to have chi inverse. So how do we do that? That's step three. Um, well, the first thing to consider is um, the way that the identity is represented in the ontological model. Um, and according to what we've just done, we had the identity here. It's going to be represented by phi followed by chi. But by diagram preservation, the representation of the identity has to just be the identity on the ontic states. So that means that phi followed by chi is the identity. OK. Um, and now we consider a very simple experiment where we just prepare and measure the system. That has to be reproduced in the ontological model. And by an uncontroversial use of diagram preservation, that's just given by uh, combining the representation of the preparation with the measurement. Um, We've already said that the representation of the preparations can be equivalently written using this chi and the measurements equivalently written using this phi. Um, but now if this is equal to this, for all possible preparations and measurements, then by local tomography, in fact, um, chi followed by phi must be the operational identity. Okay because um, you know, if, we're doing, if we're doing tomography on this gadget here, we would see that it looks just like there's no transformation happening because it's equal to this thing. Uh, and by local tomography, that means that these are actually uh, equivalent procedures. Okay, so we have that phi followed by chi is the identity and chi followed by phi is the identity. And therefore, phi is the inverse of chi, which is exactly what we wanted. Okay, so in particular, we've proven that chi is invertible. All right. Um, so now let me uh, be a bit more precise about some of the consequences of this structure theorem. Um, the first uh, just follows from the fact that that chi is invertible, um, and it goes, it's a linear transformation from the operational state space to the space of probabilities over the ontic states. The dimension of the latter is just the number of ontic states in the model. Um, and so since it's an invertible linear transformation, the dimensions have to agree. So the number of ontic states in the model has to equal the dimension of the operational state space. Um, so to take a quantum example, um, a qubit has a d squared dimensional state space. Okay, that's the dimension of the space of density operators on a qubit. Um, and so, therefore, by our structure theorem, you have to represent a qubit using d squared ontic states. Um, specializing even more to a qubit, which has a four dimensional state space, um, to represent a qubit, you're going to have to use four ontic states. And you can compare that with the result by Lucy and Hardy which says that uh, any ontological model of a qubit has to use an infinite number of ontic states. 
So if we combine these two statements, then we get another proof that uh, a qubit does not admit of a non-contextual ontological model. Um, uh, so this is also useful. So, so Lucian's result is talking about reproducing everything that a qubit does. Um, but if you're just looking at models that reproduce, um, say, the stabilizer operations on a qubit, um, then you can still apply our theorem and conclude that there are four ontic states, which means that um, models such as the one in this paper that use eight ontic states can immediately be declared contextual. Um, another nice thing we can do is notice that our proof never actually used the fact that the probabilities of an ontic state given a preparation are positive. So it would apply just as well to what's known as a quasi-probability representation, um, which is basically just like an ontological model, except it's just like a non-contextual ontological model, except that the probabilities don't have to be positive. And so our structure theorem uh, would again say that the quasi-probabilities have to be given by using some linear map chi and chi inverse. Um, and then in the language of quasi-probabilities, we'd be saying that the size of the phase space should be equal to the um, dimension of the state space in your operational theory. So if you were at uh, David Schmidt's talk on Monday, then you'll have already heard about a nice application of the structure theorem, um, which is that we used it as the first step in um, completely classifying the non-contextual ontological models of uh, the stabilizer theories in quantum theory. Um, what we found was that in odd dimensions, there's a unique one given by Gross's discrete Wigner function, and in even dimensions, there's nothing. Um, so in even dimension, in all even dimensions, the stabilizer formalism is contextual. Um, and the structure theorem was very useful in proving this result because instead of considering all the possible different um, non-contextual models you might want to think about, um, we can uh, immediately limit it down to the ones given by our structure theorem, um, which can then be sort of classified directly. Okay, um, so to conclude, uh, non-contextual ontological models of locally tomographic theories have this surprisingly rigid structure your only choice is this map chi telling you how to represent preparations. Um, the number of ontic states is fixed. And once you've chosen the representation of preparations, you get the representation of transformations and measurements for free. Um, and another way of looking at that is whenever you see a model that doesn't have this structure, you know immediately that it's contextual. If you're doing some kind of computational search for a non-contextual model, then you can build in this structure um, and that greatly limits uh, what you have to search over. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, it's a very useful first step um, towards this characterization of the stabilizer sub theory that David talked about. Okay, um, thank you very much again for tuning in and uh, I look forward to um, seeing your questions and comments. <laughs>